Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second Lunch Table Talk. I'm Carolina, and I'm the Community Engagement Associate here at Playco. We are so excited to have you. Um, if this is your first event with us, uh, Playco, or the Play Company, was founded in 2001 by founding producing producer Kate Lowald and commissions, develops, and produces new plays from around the U.S. and the world. To date, we have produced 37 new works from 14 different countries. We are based in New York City on the Lenape Hoking homeland of the Lenape people. Even as we celebrate our ability to make contemporary theater that both responds to our New York City home and today's interconnected world, we recognize that this land was forcibly taken and sovereignty was never ceded, and we acknowledge the genocide and displacement of Indigenous peoples. We will be posting our full land acknowledgement in the comments of today's event, and we invite you to share and learn more about the Indigenous peoples upon whose land you occupy. Uh, please feel free to, in the comment, in the chat section, let us know where you're calling from and if you have any questions for any of our panelists today. Um, to get us started, I would like to introduce you um, to our facilitator for today's conversation. Annie Jin Wang is the Associate Director for Programming and Communications at Playco. She is a first-generation Chinese-American dramaturg, writer, and designer whose body of work investigates constructs of race, gender, and citizenship. She also serves as the, the literary manager at Ferocious Lotus Theater Company and the artistic associate at Theater Moo. Her work has been seen at Shotgun Players, Ferocious Lotus, Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, and Theater Moo this year. As a playwright, her work has been incubated by Fresh Ground Pepper. Annie holds an MFA from Columbia University and BAs from Wellesley College. She's very busy. Um, and, <laughs> and with that, I will hand it over to Annie to introduce to you today's guests and get us started. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um, it is so great to be here uh, with our panel. We are so excited for this talk. Um, so first we'll introduce Katie Brooke. Katie Brooke is a director of new experimental plays and performance and makes original work collaboratively, collaboratively with her theater ensemble, Televiolet. Their new work, Islander, is currently running at here. In the fall of 2019, she directed the premiere of Liza Birkenmeyer's Dr. Ride's American Beach House at Ars Nova. Brooke has also worked as a creative producer at the Foundry Theater, the Builders Association, and New York City Players, and is the director of production at StoryCorps. She received her BFA from NYU's Experimental Theater Wing and her MFA from Carnegie Mellon University's School of Drama. Um, our second guest is Trish Harnito. Trish is a playwright, filmmaker, and podcast creator. Her current plays include Bender and Brian, a subversive tale of Breakfast Club fan fiction, which has been currently delayed by the pandemic, but we're hoping it'll come back very soon, and California, which was a club to thumb commission. She is also the writer of The MS Phoenix Rising, and Katie is the director. Um, she's developed and presented work at Playwrights Horizons, MTC, Soho Rep, um, in the Writers Directors Lab, Ars Nova, um, and Clubbed Thumb, New Jersey, uh, sorry, New Georges, Playco, Jack, and more. Her short film, You Wouldn't Understand, was part of the 2021 Sundance Film Festival, and they are the team behind the MS Phoenix Rising. Um, and the team behind uh, Evil Eye is Megan Sandberg, um, Zach, I'm sorry, Megan, I've mispronounced it. Zakian? Zakian? You literally told me this five minutes ago. Um, sorry, sorry, Megan. Um, I've made it more awkward. Megan Sandrick Zakian. So is awkward. God. Sorry. Um, is a theater director, author, and educator with a passion for the development of diverse new American plays for the stage and the ear. She is a co founder of Maya Directors, a consulting group for artists and organizations engaging with stories from the Middle East and beyond, a graduate of Brown University, and holds an MFA in interdisciplinary arts from Goddard College. Her first book, There Must Be Happy Endings, on a theater of optimism and honesty, is available from the Third Thing Press. Megan lives in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts, with her wife, Candace. And our last guest is um, Marjorie Shaker, who is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter. She was born in California, grew up in India, and is currently based in Jersey City. 
She is an alumna of the Juilliard Playwriting Program, a fellow at New Dramatists, and the 2020 winner of the Lanford Wilson Playwriting Award. Her audio play, Evil Eye, debuted on the Audible bestseller list in May 2019 and won the 2020 Audio Award for Best Original Work. Her play, House of Joy, received its world premiere at Cal Shakes in August 2019. She has an MFA in Dramatic Writing from USC and a dual master's degree in Global Media and Communications from the London School of Economics and USC. She is an alumna of the Ma Yu Writers Lab and the Center Theater Group Writers Workshop. She was a staff writer for the upcoming HBO show, The Nevers, and wrote the feature film adaption of Evil Eye, which was produced by Bloomhouse and is now streaming on Amazon Prime. Um, so before we start, uh, you can we just want you to know that you can download Evil Eye on Audible, and you can also access the MS Phoenix Rising um, via the Playwrights Horizon Soundstage page um, or on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us today and taking time out of um, this day. I hear it's very hot across the U.S. right now, um, so we hope that wherever you are, you are cool and that there is air conditioning. Um, so to get started, uh, let's start with a very critical question, um, which is, since this is a lunch table conversation, um, what are you planning to eat for lunch today? Are we lunch eaters? I have yeah. half of an egg burrito, and I'm saving the other half mm. for afterwards. I had a Niswaz salad, and I already ate it because, uh, well, I had made it and it looked really good. <laughs> I'm going to have whatever is down there when I go downstairs. I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I'm going to have like, I don't know, like a spinach salad or something, but probably <laughs> like three. Isn't that? Yeah. Yeah. I always feel like really good salads always last way less than they should. I wish I had a salad right now. I have <laughs> a single tomato from my garden, which is the only <laughs> one that um, the only one that was ripe enough for me to pick today. But I brought it to share. Um, so, okay, um, let's start. I have a question for Madri and Trish. Um, Evil Eye and the MS Phoenix Rising are obviously very different experiences, content-wise. But while I was listening um, to these podcasts, I really picked up on some resonances in terms of the form and the positionality of the audience to the characters um, and also between the characters themselves. Um, I really felt that there was a real sense of awareness and consideration for the uses of voice and also sound effects and music um, as the primary storytelling medium. Um, and I also thought that both utilized the dichotomy and spectrum between comedy and horror really effectively. Um, I would love to know a little bit about your creative process while you're writing sort of in general, and then what in particular you found surprising or delightful about generating for this particular format. Um, uh, I, when I start, when I got the commission from Audible to write an audio play, um, the first thing I, I thought was, well, I don't actually listen to narrative audio fiction myself. So what could I write that would make me want to listen? Um, I tend to love, I love, love, love podcasts, but I like podcasts where pe two people are talking. And I've actually found it really hard to pay attention and follow kind of an audio drama or even fictional um, audiobooks. And uh, I thought, well, I love eavesdropping on people's phone calls. <laughs> and so maybe a a play that's just phone calls, just two people talking to each other, nothing else, right? No other distractions, it's just that. That would keep my attention. So I kind of started from there. So I was able to like start writing with an idea that had the entire format baked into it. So that was really helpful to me um, to kind of start with the format and work backwards actually. Um, and the I talked to my mom on the phone every day and she's, really funny and weird and interesting and lovely. And uh, uh, I had actu actually like, I, it was um, relatively easy for me to start writing this play because uh, when I was like in my twenties, I was considering doing a one woman show about my mother, like every single theater person alive. Um, and I had in my files, I had a transcript of a phone call that we had that I called her. She said something really funny. I thought this is a really funny phone call and I wrote 
the whole thing down. So it was it was there in my computer as an MS Word file. So I just took that first, <laughs> I just took that document. I was like, here's the beginning of the play. It starts with my mother calling me and she's really upset that my cousin has gotten engaged and I'm not engaged yet. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of how Evil Eye began. It, it, the pieces were kind of starting to fit together pretty early. I was so excited <clears throat> to know that you that you also like wrote this in uh, like a like a phone call within the world of an audio medium. Um, that was something that Katie and I had had really decided together very early on. We've had I think we'll get into this later, like a little bit of a wild journey with different incarnations of this project. But um, but when we were zoning in on the podcast, um, Katie was very adamant, and I agreed very quickly because I wasn't a consumer of, you know, fictional podcasts, really. I too liked, you know, some podcasts, but they were all, you know, just conversations and stuff. And so we kind of made that decision. And then there was like no looking back. And once we like once we had like made the decision that it was all through audio, um, it kind of freed like it freed me up to make a lot of other decisions within that. And then to look at the form and for us to get really excited about, you know, in our podcast, it's a lot of conference calls or, you know, group dynamics. And so um, having spent a lot of time on calls like this, we kind of, you know, we're just drawing from almost like the negative of what it is. And, and I got really excited about, you know, what, you know, silences meant or, you know, where people were and location and things like that. And that kind of just kind of grew as we went along. Did I answer oh, that question? Like, I think yes. so. there's no wrong there's no wrong way to answer <laughs> these questions. I think, um, and then I guess it's sort of as a follow up for both of you, um, thinking about the phone call in particular um, as like a mode of modern communication that um, two people have or a group of people can have. Um, are there what were some of the considerations that you had to think about when thinking about how to construct a conversation? between two people or multiple people on the phone versus um, two people who may be talking to each other, um, you know, face to face. Well, to me, I mean, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just gonna uh, ask Megan. <laughs> Cause this was something we really had to figure out in the uh, recording when we got there. To, like it's like simple questions like wait whose point of view is this phone call which I never had to think about but then when you convert it into an audio format like the engineer and the designer want to know who's the point of view um yeah I don't know that was that was just like a very simple thing that I had not thought about before and it just kind of I think I think informed the the story in a really interesting way yeah and a lot of that sort of thing about point of view ended up um being about genre, like we 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 started we started to think of Evil Eye as being um, like as like traveling through genres, uh, and there's sort of there's there's I feel like there's some of that in in y'all's piece too, although it stays in one genre for longer I think than Evil Eye does, and it is longer mm -hmm. than Evil Eye too. Um, but you know, in this nine the ninety minutes of Evil Eye, we were like it goes from romantic comedy to like family drama to thriller. And um, so then the point of view, the sort of phone call point of view became really important within that in terms of uh, setting up people's expectations about um, who, uh, who, who was driving sort of like the emotional feeling of that. Um, and then when you get into the more of like the thriller place, there's a more, you know, more of a zoom out, like more of a, that, that, that shot where you're like looking through the window spying kind of thing. Um, which is harder to get with a phone call. Um, I was we, thinking well, about how we were both in like very different kinds of phone calls, but phone calls nonetheless. And then both projects end up yeah, breaking yeah, out of phone calls. Too. Yeah. 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 In, also in really different ways and tonally so different. But I just, I was reflecting on that and feeling like there might be, you know, it's something to do with us needing to make sure the audience knows what, we're like kind of taking care of the audience in a way that in the theater, I don't always do as a director um, uh, where I, you know, I really want the audience to be like understanding what's going on. Like you're listening into a phone call, you're listening to a conference call, whatever. And then once we kind of have that trust, 
hopefully, then you, we can like break. And for us at the end, we still had a convention around it, which was that it was this radio show. But that was, you know, it, it, it was still a jump that the audience had to do to like open up to listening, not to a conference call. Um, and I thought you guys did that beautifully too. Like I, I was, I felt very, um, for lack of a better word, like safe in the world. Like I could just listen in, listen in. And then suddenly you put me in this situation that was actually quite scary. And I would just add like one of the things that I <clears throat> was, I always got really excited about and, um, and Annie, I, I'm, uh, I was very happy to hear you like lump us in with the word horror because it's a whole different type of horror, but mm -hmm. I, I would like to agree that there's a corporate horror kind yeah. of that grows in our piece. And, you know, we have so many characters that we follow that kind of one of, one of like the fun things to do, like when thinking about the medium specifically of like writing for these calls were like just how people join late, how people leave, what etiquette is like, what's followed, what's not, and how kind of now all of that has to inform character as well as move the story forward. And so that like everything kind of had to do a lot of different things. And, um, and that was really exciting to do, uh, especially as we, our whole conceit and construct is, is kind of mounting pressure every episode and like kind of this train wreck sort of thing of like, Oh no. And so I think that we, we got to a place where the form and how we built it kind of worked towards, you know, informing the piece itself too. Yeah. Thank you all so much for that extended <laughs> conversation. I think this is a great segue um, into my next question, which is for Megan and Katie. Um, I know your work primarily as directors uh, for the theater. And I think most of, um, you know, your fans do as well. Um, I'm curious to know about what sorts of discoveries you made um, about your own artistic practice when you were working in this form. For example, um, were there any techniques or pedagogies that you would typically or you know frequently use for stage performance that you felt um, were or were that you discovered um, didn't translate, or conversely, um, that worked better than you had expected for this format? I'm just happy that we both have fans, um, first of all. So thank you for that. Me too. <laughs> um, I'm also I'm also a big fan of Katie. We go way back. Uh, <laughs> we do. Um, uh, Likewise. Are you going to answer I, first? Yes, I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to answer like a tiny little thing and then sure. kick it to you, which is like I feel like my the biggest thing for me that was um that felt like a go-to in in uh in a stage play that i couldn't do as a director in at least this kind of audio setup was literally going up to the actor and talking to them face to face um and i, I we were you know in the way that evil eye was recorded it sounds so amazing now since we're all in the same place in a studio which was crazy but um uh we were we were all in the, the Audible studios in Newark, but because of the kind of isolation they were trying to get uh, for you know one one half of the phone call being in India and the other half of the phone call being in the U.S., um, the actors were in separate studios and we were in a booth. So it was all it was funny. It was like all uh, through headphones, which now I'm really used to. Um, but you know, directing that way. But at the time, I, I was not. Um, and I had to really be like incredibly vocally specific speaking to the actors through um, the mic into their headphones. Uh, and and I actually, I could, you know, speak individually to one actor. I could talk to both of them. I could speak just to the people in the booth, but it was um, the, the, the proximity and the physical reality of like my relationship to the actors was something that I was not prepared to be sort of stripped away from me in that way. And I've been thinking about it so much during um, quarantine because obviously we'll, we've, many of us have had to, to work that way um, now, but it was, it was very hard for me in that, uh, in that experience. And Katie, we're, I assume you guys were recording remotely. We were, and, and we, recorded, um, we recorded remotely, everyone was remote, but what we did which was uh, 
uh, it started as just, this is an experiment, but it was just, it ended up being obviously the way to do it for us, which was we had everybody in a Zoom room together um, who were in a scene. And we, so it was, a, it was sort of like, almost like a new play process kind of vibe. Um, and then they were recording on their own devices. And so because we were doing conference calls and we were actually interested in some kind of compromised audio, that was totally fine. Um, on another project, it would have been unsatisfying, but what it meant was that we were prioritizing, I was prioritizing the acting among the, um, the actors, like the, the, the scenes, the dynamics between them. And I realized for me very early on, in fact, even before we did this, like going into it, I um, I really wanted the acting to be believable. And that may not be a remarkable thing to say for some folks, but I, for me in the theater, I, I'm not always aiming for realistic performances. Um, sometimes I'm really not aiming for that. Um, and But in audio, I actually think it's so important, at least as a listener for me, it's like, because it's already abstracted by having no bodies, I kind of need that to connect to. And so I was really interested in the acting. I mean, not, not to say that the, the, the style of the whole piece is realist, it's not. But in terms of the way that the actors are um, interacting with one another and having you know what they're saying be motivated and that you feel that sort of conference call verisimilitude thing, that was really, really important. And so we recorded it where it felt like we were all on a call together. And um, I would say the other thing that's just going back to the original question that's different um, from the way I might work in the theater is that um, uh, in the theater, I'm really interested in pace and like, because it's live, it's a live experience and the sort of um, dynamic between, between audience and, and performers and among performers um, and, with design, all that stuff, like the pacing of something really, really matters. And when when working in this way, it matters too, but it doesn't matter in terms of the way you're working with actors as much because you can do a lot afterwards. And so that was like a real pleasure for me because I don't work in film and television. So I'm not used to having that kind of control. And that was actually really fun. And I think for Trish and I both and for Ben, who was um, doing the engineering and sound design, like that was where we got into sort of the more detailed uh, pacing work, obviously, that I would normally be doing as a director with the actors. Um, and then I guess I would say that the other thing that's different is just because we decided to make this episodic, the arc of it is just different in terms of like, you know, wanting to keep people engaged in a different way. They're not, um, you know, they're not captive in a theater. So it's like, it's a different relationship with the audience too. Can I add one thing, Katie? I feel like we talked a lot about, um, like you're right, it did seem like this new play development process, but only at the beginning because yeah. we didn't have rehearsals. So it honestly, it kind of then morphed. I mean, we had very limited rehearsal. It then morphed into more of like, you know, a film shoot. TV, people, yeah. People had to yeah. really like know what they were doing right away. There wasn't going to be a ton of time yeah. to make discoveries through repetition or trial and error. I mean, we did have some time, but it was very truncated. And I think that is a huge like difference in process too. Yeah, absolutely. So you, Trish, you hinted at this a little bit earlier um, in the conversation. Uh, I would love to know, um, because I heard tell that this podcast series was originally conceived as a live theater piece and then um, became, was re maybe was like reconceived uh, as a podcast. It um, had a long journey. A long journey. <laughs> like, I would love like, like, like this. I mean, yeah. yeah. You know what? I would like, love to know about that journey. Yeah. So, I mean, the original, original conceit of it came, Katie was going to pitch a podcast, I think. And we ended up like um, <clears throat> discussing what, what was like a very bare bones idea that was conference calls like and that was but it was like you know that I turned into like a one page outline but then that kind of went away and life went on and this was you know I think in like 2018 or something like that um and then we got busy with other projects and stuff and then I got a commission from NYU to do a new play and <clears throat> I and I 
wanted to do this idea. And so I did write this as a play because before it was like, you know, an outline of like 10 episodes. Like it, it was not, it was a, a concept basically. It was a concept. Yeah. yeah. It's like cruising, so, conference calls, ENSCO. Yeah. Ionesco, right. All those things have always been there. Exactly. And so then I, over the course of a couple months, you know, it was really fast for me, I actually wrote this play and did it and put it up on a full production with um, NYU students. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and learned a lot about it. It was like, you know, it was, it was really exciting. It, it wasn't great. I mean, it wasn't what you see now, but that's when I wrote the whole ending there. And like, there's a lot, a lot of it translated, I would say about from the play version, which honestly is no one will ever read again, you know, from that, ver like I, I would have to do a new play version, you know what I mean? Like, so this initial play version, probably like 60% and like a lot of the spine translated, but, or was re, you know, and then had to reinvent so much and like composite characters and blah, 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 and add new things and, and just kind of like let that go and keep what would work in this format. Um, I think Trish did a lot of character development in the playwriting of it, yeah. I would say. That might be the most significant, like, yeah, well, thing that, that I felt like Trish. Like all of the, the arc of the journey was developed in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's been through so much, you know, and then by the time that we got this play co-commission, um, it was great to have a text to work with, you know, and to do the pilot. Um, and even that changed so much while we were, you know, working on it. Um, mm -hmm. And then wrote the rest of them very fast over the summer. And then we started recording with playwrights. And um, so the, the, the speed of the process couldn't have happened without the play version. Yeah. 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 Um, something that I will say in regards to um, the ending of the MS Phoenix Rising, I will tell you that, um, you know, as I was listening, I definitely got like the incisive commentary on how PR and marketing can, can flatten um, artistic work. But I also sense that there was like actually a really good amount of tenderness um, towards the people that were working in these, um, in these sectors, the arts, cultural entertainment. Um, and then I was also struck by the fact that we also, you know, we see the consequences of being overwhelmed by the questions that art can ask of us when we've been deprived of it. And so um, I will say that, you know, in the, in the, without giving away spoilers, I thought like the very earnest performance in the last, uh, <laughs> in the last episode, really, I was just like, yes, you know, it's kind of a cheesy ending, but I'm totally into it. And then like the last beat totally flattened me. I think I like Great. screamed in my, I screamed <sighs> in my empty house, like, <laughs> you know, um, and similarly, you know, when um, Megan and, and Madre, you talked about sort of the evil eye going through um, different genres and when the turn happened, I also screamed. <laughs> and I thought that was really, um, it's just fun and exciting, I think, to be able to uh, feel the, the story turning um, through sort of a similar, through the format of, you know, just listening to people talking to each other and sort of being a fly on the wall. Um, but I thought something that was interesting in um, how I sort of position these, these pieces um, alongside each other is that I thought, while well, you know, phone calls um, and conference calls in MS Phoenix Rising could often be used to signify um, sort of like really the distance and the gap in communication between um, different characters that for the characters in Evil Eye, um, the phone calls are actually, they're often their most meaningful point of connection. And I know for me as like the child of immigrants and as somebody who currently I'm living with my parents because of the pandemic, but I'm hopefully, you know, moving back to New York soon and will be apart again, um, that phone calls are often how we feel the closest to each other. And also was when, you know, we as an audience felt the closest to these characters. Um, and so I thought distance is always sort of an interesting, in time and space is always an interesting thing to play with in these kinds of pieces. Um, I'm curious for um, the Evil Eye team, you know, what were some of the distances that had to be bridged during this creative process, whether um, they were physical distances, like Megan, you mentioned, you know, the difference in just where the performers were compared to where um, you and Mondry were. Uh, versus, um, you know, different emotional or cultural 
points that you felt like um, for the piece, you know, had to, like you had to work hard or were there basically any moments um, where you felt like it was important that we um, get the intention and the meaning of this across to the audience? We had a brilliant um, dialect coach working with us and a fight choreographer. Um, I feel really bad I forgot her name at the moment. Um, the the dialect coach was Cherie. Right? Cherie, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I feel like she was so instrumental in helping us bridge those very gaps. You know, there were things like, for instance, um, two of the, th two, three of the characters in the piece are um, Indians from India and uh, most of our cast are um, from here or England. And so uh, we, we needed help, like helping the actors to kind of access that those 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 parts of the characters um and even though it was an audio play we needed a fight choreographer to actually help us figure out how do we um how do we communicate like an act of violence that takes place late in the play um yeah i don't know i just feel like writing the play was a deeply emotional and very very difficult process and took a lot of rewrites and each time we were just trying to dig deeper and get um get closer to the truth, which, you know, it's a, it's a very dark play. So it was very hard to like, keep pushing ourselves to go there. Uh, I don't know, Megan, I'm curious about what else you felt like or the challenges. It's funny, I'm glad you, you brought up um, the, the, the writing of it, because I, I feel like that was probably the biggest bridging that happened. But I, you know, it's sort of not my story to tell. But I think there was, you know, there was a moment in the in the development of the piece where you, you you essentially were like, well, I guess I really need to look at like the scariest question, uh, you know, the, the, this, this big scary looming question that's related to um, to marriage and love related to my relationship with my mom. And, you know, and, and I think that it was I was surprised you were surprised. Both of us were like, oh, this this. Uh, you know, fun audio thriller actually is about like the sort of like incredibly vibrating, huge, central, um, painful question uh, and fear. Um, so, so that was that felt like a big a big distance to bridge as you were asking about Annie and and yeah the <laughs> um, the moment where we realized that we had to have hi Janie. <laughs> um, the moment where we realized uh, the, the magic behind the scenes. Um, thank you for all your support. Uh, the, the moment that we realized that um, we needed to work with a fight choreographer and a vocal coach at the same time in the room at the same time to, rec to realize the fight was totally mind blowing. So we had and we you picture us like in we're in like the green room at Audible, which is extremely small. Um, and there's these three there's these three actors that you know have to have this moment of you know very very extreme physical violence. And uh, so the fight choreographer takes them through essentially choreographs the fight. Um, so they're in and this is all happening in like two hours. Uh, they're in the they're in the studio. They're, they're, they're doing the fight. And then the, the, the vocal coach is like listening to all the sound that they're making as they're doing the fight. And then like coaches them through how to recreate the fight sonically. So she's, so she's saying things like, okay, you know, that moment when, uh, spoilers, I don't know, the moment when X happens, um, you can't actually do that action while you're in the studio in front of the mic. So the action that I recommend is you hold your own hand behind your back and you struggle against, you know, or whatever, right? And so the vocal the vocal coach would like give a substitute for um, for the physical action that would generate the vo <laughs> the like believable um, vocal response. And it's so believable listening to it. You just cannot imagine that they are they're all like standing in front of a mic in separate rooms it was, actually they were in the same room for that i think yeah. they were in the same room um, but they were 
doing weird stuff. <laughs> we were doing very, very, very weird stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we were so lucky to have uh, Cherie Rice is her name. And sh she's like a brilliant actor, brilliant vocal coach and a fight choreographer. Like how, how often do you get to work with an artist like that? Who's just, and we really needed her. Um, and she did a few other little voices for the play as well. Um, yeah, that was really thrilling. That was so thrilling. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, we had we actually had a separate fight choreographer who and and and, and the, the choreographer's name I'm not remembering, but then Cherie like really? stepped oh in my and God, translated. The worst. Okay, okay. Man, yeah, but it was all so fast, you know, yeah. that's the thing as as Trish and Katie were mentioning about the about creating audio. It's like yeah. you know, that moment was all done in a couple of hours and um it was it's uh, but but yeah, I would say that that the the in terms of distances that were bridged, like the distance between what you do with your physical body and space and how you recreate physical action with breath and and um, vocal fullness uh, is a is a is a really exciting and and actually a kind of moving thing to to be part of because. Um, there's a, as we've been talking about, there's like an intimacy to the form. And when you, when an actor sort of translates something physical into something that can like just go all the way into your, into your headphones and be with you like that, it, it can feel quite, um, yeah, just, it feels very close in a way that, that I love. Um. Trish and Katie, were there any, was there any choreography to the last episode <laughs> from this remix? <laughs> yeah. Wait, yeah so so much that you didn't see. And before, Katie, before you talk, oh. this is such a perfect segue for, to talk about how we did the last episode. <clears throat> but this is like a fun thing that I love. In the stage version of this that we did at NYU, <laughs> Liza Birkenmeyer, good friend of, you know, collaborator of ours, she was the choreographer for the actual spoiler alert last number she did an incredible job and so when i was writing i had a you know i had a recording of that production and when i was working on the last episode there's some commentary that happens describing what's going on and it is pulled absolutely from that mm -hmm. choreography that happened in that live production that no one will ever see again anyway but yeah I I love what Megan just described, and I can't say that we did that with the dances, though. Yeah. But I, now that I know that that's possible and that's how you got those sounds, I'm like, oh, I want to do a fight in a podcast because <laughs> it really I mean, was think, effective. Yeah. Well, yeah, but also like what you did, you did kind of do it because yours is all from the audience members' perspective. Yeah, exactly. Like we're getting the breath and the response and yeah. the like embodied feeling of sitting in the audience. I mean, the the dis there's a distance from the bodies of the performers, and in that case, so I I thought, yeah, I think I think it was that was really beautifully done, and and just I mean, we haven't I haven't gotten a chance to say like, oh my God, I, 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 I was laughing and also like very, very profoundly disturbed by MS Phoenix Rising. <laughs> like, oh, and, and just, I, I just finished listening to it this morning. I'm a little bit like, I need to talk. Can we, Danny, can we talk about this play? Um, but uh, yeah, really, wow. Um, everyone should listen, but read all the trigger warnings. Well, <laughs> good, yeah, exactly. There's lots of them. Um, uh, I guess the thing you're making me think of too, Megan, is like what we did with Eric, I think was, uh, I, I think we figured out a really good thing with the, with Eric who played Terrence Standish, who's like the radio host, Eric Berryman, wonderful actor, um, where he is like Trish said, sort of narrating some of what he sees on, on this. There's a, so there's a show at the end that's like on stage and he's narrating some of what he sees. And of course, that's a device so that we understand what he's seeing and it leads to the climax of the, of the piece. But um, the way we did record that was had him listen to um, everything else that was happening during this performance. And then, and then he was speaking over it actually. So, so there was a bit of um, you know authentic stimulation of him. Um, so, we did, we did a lot of takes of him just going, mm, uh-huh, 
Oh yeah, good one. Kind of like stuff that we then were able to use. So we 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 were um, I think you know in our in our own way doing a little bit of that to try to like bring a sense of like physicality and actuality to this this moment at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, and like the actors, some of the actors have to sing, so there's physicality to that. I, I feel like you know that's the one. I'm so happy with how it turned out, but that a lot is because of great engineering. Um, yeah, we the, wanted to do that in person. We would have loved to do that in a studio. Yeah. yeah, but that was people in their own home. So um, I say, and I want to give a shout out to our musical director, yeah. <clears throat> Riley Thomas, who I also like co-wrote the end. The, he wrote the music, and we co-wrote the lyrics. He was incredible, and there was kind of three different like odd feats of audio engineering at the end. Then the first one was all of this, all of these actors had to record all of this remotely and by themselves. And so, you know, having Katie and Riley and them like, like go through this and then piece it together as if it's a live show and mix it as if it's a live show and have that be this standalone thing that's then Megan, like you're saying, the audience filter and then Tara, the, the radio mm -hmm. show filter. It was like, it, I, it's like one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life is put it together that way, honestly. And I think mm -hmm. that it's incredible what we what what we were able to do in isolation. Yeah, too. Yeah. Um, I do want to get to our Q and A while we still have a little bit of time. Um, but before that, um, since I think Trish, your last comment, you know, feeds into this question. Um, what do you think is for everyone? What do you think is the role that podcasts and audio plays will play in the larger theater ecosystem um, as we are moving through this pandemic? Maybe not out, but through in one way or another. Um, but hopefully, one day beyond. Well, as a fan of audio drama and podcasts, like al already, like I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this form, and I'm excited that theater artists might want to work in it because I think. Um, and, and there are a lot of great fiction podcasts out there, but I feel like that theater artists are really smart and exciting and I want more of us to be in that space and not just people that are coming from, you know, more, more podcasting or TV sort of background. So I'm, I'm excited about that because it, it's also, it's a, it's a form that I care about. And so I, I hope that like we as a as like theater artists can like feed it and grow it and make it you know a, a bigger industry i agree <laughs> i think i think katie put it so well um i love that it's having a bit of a resurgence and i feel like um i don't know i uh i feel like a, a radio play or an audio play is actually such a lovely communal thing that you can have in the privacy of your own home even. You can put it on and do a puzzle together or you can put it on and like clean the house together. You know, I feel like that's one way I, I've heard that people have experienced Evil Eye, which makes me really happy, like on road trips or mm -hmm. it's theater in the privacy of your home and I or in the intimacy of like really personal spaces. I just really like that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I mean, we're not going back. I think hopefully, yeah, there's just gonna be more and more interesting new um, content to come in this particular format. And I totally agree with everything yeah, Katie and M Midori said. Uh, I would only add to that, that like I'm excited about um, like breaking the structure further and seeing what we can do within it and all the ideas that <clears throat> people are gonna have once they really you know consider what it is to live within that structure. I feel like we're just kind of scratching the surface there. Yeah, and I would just add for myself that that I, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a lifelong audio, audio head. I've always, I listened to, I used to listen to books on tape, um, and so I, 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 I've always loved hearing stories that way. Actually, used to first listen to the, my Disney read along records on my little Fisher Price record player, um, but I think that. Uh, for me, and I've, I've been grappling with, and other family members of mine have been grappling with some health issues during the pandemic. And um, when 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 it isn't always possible to view live theater, and it, is, it isn't always possible for some of us to look at screens, um, that uh, audio theater is uh, a really um, 
special and uh, just for me a, a highly accessible way for for me to take in some storytelling and um, and and actually for me it's the most it's the least taxing way on my instruments to take in mm. storytelling. So I, I really appreciate uh, the resurgence of the form and the fact that I can experience so many cool artists uh, working in that form now and excited for it to continue. And now we have questions. Great, yes. Um, I think we'll have time for one question, but I think this is a really good one. Um, our, let's see, Claire from the audience asks, um, I'm a writer, an actor, and audiobook narrator, about to start work on my first audio theater series. Congratulations. Um, advice on where to start or what scripts to read, shows to listen to? Well, sure. obviously ours. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would say though that there's, there's um, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot happening in this space that's outside of the theater scene too. So just familiarize yourself with that as well. Um, and this is not, I'm not seeing this as like a recommendation, like I love it kind of thing, but like know what Gimlet's doing. Like there, cause that's popular. And I think that it's worth, you know, knowing about, I think some of their work is better than others. Um, but uh, then there's also like, I guess I'll just, can I just plug a couple things that I think are really exciting? Um, I love this this podcast series called "Come On, Come Out." It's not um, it's not uh, it's not theater. It's it's very much like a podcast, but it's a fiction sort of hybrid fiction podcast. So, like that's a place to you know hear something that doesn't have a theater background, but it's like a really successful, funny fiction podcast. Um, I also think on the very other end of the spectrum. Sybil Kempson's work um, from this past year, um, which she did with my friend Chris Giarmo and a bunch of great other artists. Um, it's really, it's an audio drama. It is thick. You have to like really sit still in, in a dark room to listen to it. Um, and it's so worth it. It's really incredible and moving um, and funny. Um, and uh, that's, I, I will pass the mic to anyone else who wants to take it. Um, I would say that the the rest of the Audible Emerging Playwrights commissions are all really worth listening to for like one shot audio. If you're looking for serial audio uh, plays, they're not they're not that. They're they're much more like listen to the whole thing all the way through in ninety minutes or two hours. Um, and there's you know you can look based on the genre of whatever you're working in potentially. Another thriller one that's so good on there is um, Leah Nanako Winkler's Nevada Ton, which I just mm -hmm. absolutely love. Um, and uh, a, a, a sweet one, if you're looking for that, is Tiny Father, Mike Lou's Tiny Father, which is just like absolutely su super sweet. Um, and then with serial stuff, um, I, I would love to plug a couple of like small independent theaters that have put podcast stuff out there that I think is really good. Um, there's a there's one that the Wilbury Group in Providence, Rhode Island did called An Agnostic Talks to God. Um, that's this, cool. well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's this, these, convers these conversations between a, an agnostic guy who starts hearing God talking to him in the rain. Um, and, uh, and then um, I directed one for Speakeasy Stage here in Boston uh, called The Usual Unusual, which is about the last, the fictional last, gay bookstore in Boston. Um, and uh, it's both of those are, are sort of longer serial format um, and very, very narrative, very sort of like straight ahead narrative. There's a lot of other weird stuff out there, probably the stuff that Katie can tell you about. I'll also oh. throw out a little advice thing too, which is I, I think doing a proof of concept is really important for this, especially if it's the first time you're working in this form whether that means making something fully that's five minutes long or just like getting together and do a, doing a rough recording with friends. Like for me, having a little experience in this space before doing this, it was a, still a huge learning curve in terms of like really figuring out what the tone and the, and the method for making is. So I would just suggest that. Um, I also want to recommend another indie theater series, uh, um, Audio, audio theater series. It's called Paperless Pulp and it's by Flying V Theater out of DC and you can find it on Spotify. Okay. So that's like 30 minutes to an hour, little short plays. And I think they have like two seasons and like six plays per season. So that's really lovely if you just wanna like go for a walk and listen to a play. 
Um, and I think their business model too might be helpful in terms of like, how do you as a small independent creator make quality stuff? Um, yeah. They don't, I have nothing to add. You guys said everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, then we do have time for a second question. Um, Jeannie, can you bring up a second question for us? Um, great. Ha oh, okay. Well, we're bringing that up. Um, has the pandemic changed your process in creating a narrative for new work? Are you seeing things move in a more positive direction or do more of the same challenges of recent years still exist? Hmm. I wonder what that means by creating a narrative for new work. Mm -hmm. Like, is that like a meta question about like the larger narrative of our lives? Or is it about, are we telling different stories within the stories we're telling? I mean, I, I don't know, I'm actually curious what everybody else thinks. I don't know what positive direction quite means to, I would love this if there's, we could go a lot of different directions with this question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wonder if it's about if if there's a sense of like the the way that that work is developed in the American theater, the sort of the the machine of development, and and whether the pandemic has changed that at all, um, or I mean, a, a more positive narrative. Oh, interesting. It's so funny. Like I don't, I I would never think about writing and positivity in the same. <laughs> like I don't, I don't under, I don't understand. But, but I'll take a stab at process because I think that um, <clears throat> I'm. Um, I didn't really. I wasn't really excited about working on plays during the pandemic, honestly, and like not excited about Zoom and and things weren't translating. And so I think that what's changed for me is I am very excited about audio now. You know. And I very much also know that it's okay not to work on a new play all the time too. And like, that's been informative, I think, for like my own process to branch out and, you know, work on, you know, work on some short films and work on a podcast. And then all of a sudden, all of these things, they do inform each other as you, you know, keep learning and getting better at doing them. And I do think that it, it will work itself, you know, into how I want to tell a story now. Um, and so, I guess that sounds positive, right? <laughs> but, yeah. Great. Um, so on that note, unless anybody has a, a closing statement that they would like to make, um, we are nearing the end of our time. Alas, I feel like we could talk about audio dramas forever and the process of making them and which ones we love. Um, I wanted to thank our guests so much again for their time, Katie Brooke, Trish Harnato, Megan sandberg zakian and um, Marjorie Shekhar, thank you so much for taking time to come and chat and share your wisdom and your process. Um, I am, okay. Um, I'm gonna bring uh, Carolina back up to sort of close us, to close us out. Um, oh. Thank you, Annie, so much. Oh, really thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah, of course. Um, I just wanna say thank you all again for having this amazing conversation. What, are, what we're learning with like these lunch table talks, is like an hour is never really enough because you're all so, so fascinating. And the way that you approach the work is so smart and um, guided with such love. Um, so thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. Um, and I'm gonna do a little bit more like talking about our programming. So feel free if you have like other things to do today to say your goodbyes to our little virtual audience. If not, you can totally stay and hang on while I tell uh, everyone else about the residencies that we have coming up. Um, so um, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, before we wrap up, I wanna let you know about our upcoming programming. Uh, we have presentations for our 2021 residency for black women theater makers that will be taking place from September 20th to the 30th. So please stay tuned for more information about the residency artists and their presentations. Um, lastly, as a small theater company, we are committed to providing 
affordable access to our artistic programming, whether it be a main stage production or a digital event as this, and equitable compensa compensation for all of our artists and guests. The support and engagement of our community goes a long way towards ensuring that we're able to continue to do this work. Um, the easiest way to stay in touch with us, if this is your first time with us, uh, please follow us on social media, please join our mailing list. Um, additionally, if you're able to, always we appreciate donations of any amount um, or to find send a rich friend towards us. Um, and of course, when we produce our first on-site production next spring, we can't wait to welcome you all back into the theater. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks everyone, this was lovely. Thank you.